Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I want to talk about a book I just finished reading on my Kindle called Faith, Reason, and Earth History, A Paradigm of Earth and Biological Origins by Intelligent Design. Very catchy title there. This is the third edition uh, of the book. It came out in 2016, published by Andrews University Press. And the authors are Leonard Brand and Arthur Chadwick. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. I really enjoyed reading it. It stretched me in a variety of ways, and I've been really looking forward to putting together a review video to share uh, my thoughts on the book with you. Um, as you can probably pick up from the title, this is a book uh, about creation and evolution, a book about the age of the earth, a book about the interplay between faith, and what they mean by that really is the evangelical Christian faith, and reason, and really what they're talking about in that way is not so much the broader philosophical discussions of faith and reason, but really the more narrow way that that often gets framed in 20th and 21st century Western context, which is science and faith, science and religion, science and Christianity. What's the relationship between these things? And Leonard Brand and Arthur Chadwick are writing as, um, as Christians, as conservative Christians. Both of them are um, scientists who are researchers, they publish broadly, not only in um, kind of, you know, Christian or creationist uh, scientific journals, but in, you know, uh, broader academic scientific journals, um, and are also uh, professors at uh, universities. Both of them teach at Southern, uh, at Seventh-day uh, Adventist University, so I'm assuming that's the theological uh, viewpoint that they're coming from. Um, and while I would have some concerns in general about the Seventh-day Adventist uh, church, certainly some issues to be aware of if you're talking about attending one or something, um, I really didn't see any of that theology coming through uh, in the book. So just a note about the background there, but for the purposes of this book, I didn't really see that being an issue. Uh, really, one of the things that I like about the book is the fact that um, although they are Christians and they're explicit about saying, Part of why we um, hold to this view, or part of why we've um, pursued this approach to, you know, life and creation and the age of the earth, is because of the biblical witness. That's that's one of the impetuses behind what they're doing. They really do a good job, I think, of trying to kind of focus on their own area of expertise and make this a book about the science. And I appreciate that because something that you'll find if you read. Um, books about this issue is sometimes you'll have, you know, well-meaning Christian scientists who try to do a lot of theological or exegetical reflections, which can be appropriate at a certain level, um, but they don't always have the training or uh, expertise to handle those things maybe with as much care as should happen. And the same happens on the other side. Sometimes you get theologians or pastors who are kind of, you know, repeating scientific arguments they've heard from a scientist, but we don't really have the training or experience to own those ourselves, or at least many of us don't. And so we can end up maybe getting details wrong and things that might weaken our argument. So I really think the best way to handle this issue, and, and again, it's a cluster of issues. It's a whole network of questions that come up when, it, when you come to the question of um, God as creator, the way in which he created the age of the earth, all of that is very complex. And so I think the best way to handle that is to have theologians who are dealing with the exegetical and theological side and scientists who are reading what they're saying, but also writing about the scientific side, and, and together you get a good, strong argument. So this would not be the book I would recommend if you're trying to do a deep dive into what does the Bible say about these things. There are other books that I think are better on that topic, uh, but that's a topic for another review video. But uh, the authors are really not trying to do that. They're not trying to do a deep dive into what Scripture says about this. What they're really doing is saying, okay, let's assume that what the Scripture teaches is uh, that God is the Creator, that He specially created humankind, that He created um, different kinds of creatures and animals right at the beginning. So you don't have this view of life as you do in, uh, let me put my Kindle down for a second, you don't have this view of life that you get in a Darwinian system where all life descends from a common ancestor through a process of natural random mutation and things like that. They're saying that's not what the scripture teaches. It teaches God as the creator, and they would argue it teaches uh, a, a young earth that's uh, much more recent than the billions and billions of years that we so often hear about. And so they're assuming that's what the scripture is saying. They make a few arguments about it along the way, 
But the burden of the book is not so much to demonstrate what the Bible is saying about these things, but rather to say, okay, if that's what the Bible is saying, how does that fit, how can we fit that with what we see in the natural world, with what we see in the realm of science? And so they're trying to present a positive vision of how to um, scientifically explain and explore uh, the world based on what the scripture says about the origin of the world, and specifically to interact with the claims of, of evolution. And, and as they'll go on to clarify, they're talking about um, Darwinian uh, evolution, macroevolution, we might say. Again, that idea that all life descends from a common ancestor, uh, the, the view that kind of excludes God from the picture altogether, or just puts him, you know, some theological uh, or theistic evolutionist will kind of have God as the, the first mover. He gets the ball rolling, but then evolution is this means that he uses to allow humans to develop and everything else, and then that's how things unfold. And they're saying, no, we're seeing God creating humanity right at the beginning. We're seeing God creating, you know, birds and reptiles and mammals and all these different creatures right at the beginning. Um, and so how do we how do we interact with those competing uh, visions of not only what the scriptures say, but of what we expect to see in the world around us? And so the book is an, a sustained argument. Again, it's 600 pages written by researchers and professors and scientists, 600 pages of sustained argument for a young earth view of creation. Now, the authors um, don't use the term creationism, and they explain that at the beginning of the book. They say that that's a term that has become so kind of mangled and abused that if you present yourself as a creationist, uh, particularly in the scientific community, people will just write you off. They'll just dismiss you. They've got a kind of caricatured view uh, of things. And rightly or wrongly, I, I think that that probably is the case. And so the, the term that they try to use is um, that uh, they see themselves as informed interventionists. In other words, what they're saying is we're functioning as scientists, but we're functioning as scientists with the recognition that there is a God who has created the world and who can intervene in that creation at, at key points, and that that's a valid scientific argument to make. And they spend extensive time talking about those things. And this gets to one of the things that I really appreciate about the book as well. Like I said, I appreciate the fact, fact that this is a, a good book focused on the science written by good scientists who are researchers and professors, not just people who are working, you know, full-time as apologists for a creation ministry or something, not that that's wrong, but I think there's a, an added weight um, that comes to, you know, how they make their argument and where that's coming from. I'll say more about that in a moment, but that's one thing I like about the book. Uh, the other thing I like about the book is that it does spend some good time, especially at the beginning, laying some foundation work and thinking about terminology and de dealing with uh, issues of, of, of the, the philosophy of science. What exactly is science? How does the scientific process work? How do we come to the current scientific process? And what are the strengths and limitations of that process? And so they walk through, you know, science as a discipline, the philosophy of science, different approaches to science, and the history of science. How have uh, our, our understanding, how has our, how has our understanding of the world grown and developed over time? And how do scientific paradigms um, rise and fall? How do they develop? How do they change? Because one of the features of science, and any good scientist will tell you this, is that what we, uh, what we hold to today will probably be either revised or overturned in years to come. In other words, we expect to learn more, and we expect our understanding of the world to change and grow and develop. That doesn't mean that, you know, A becomes non-A, in terms of you know what we're arguing for, what we're seeing, although sometimes that happens, we realize, oh, this was just totally wrong. But oftentimes it's a refined understanding, a deeper understanding of things. But the scientific process is really built around that pursuit, and we'll even use that language, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of science. We expect there to be new discoveries. And so the question is, um, how do we uh, reach those new discoveries, and what are the obstacles that um, exist there? And so they spend a good bit of time in the first 100, 150 pages, just kind of walking through some of those issues. And it's very helpful because it frames the debate that comes up between uh, competing views about the origin of life and competing views about the age of the earth. Those are, those are both relevant questions. They're important questions. Often we want to dive straight into them. But behind those questions are a whole lot of other 
issues and assumptions that we need to think about carefully. And Brand and Chadwick are, are trying to, to help us do that. So they do a great job of doing that. And then they have probably about 200, 250 pages dealing with the question of the origin of life. And so what's at view there is evolution as we think of it. And one of the things that they do right at the front end, and this is something you'll find in other creationist uh, writings or interventionist writings, if you want to use their term, uh, is that there's an important distinction to make between macroevolution and microevolution. Um, Darwinian uh, evolutionary thought, or the neo-Darwinian synthesis, as, as it's sometimes called, holds to both of these things. Uh, macroevolution is the idea that, again, all life that we see on Earth whether it's plant life or animal life or, you know, whatever it is, all life on earth descends from a common ancestor and that that process of, of the development of, you know, different um, phylum and classes and, you know, all the different, you know, you can go down the tree there, all of that developed from one original life form and, um, and develops via a process of random mutations over time some of which are beneficial, some of which develop into new orders and classes and all of this stuff. And, and as you look at the amazing diversity of life that we see on our planet, that has come via that process of macroevolution, right? That's central to the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Now, along with that is uh, an embrace of microevolution, the idea that certainly within species, um, but you, know, you can kind of go even a little further up the tree from there, that you will have new types of creatures growing or developing. So for example, we could take, you know, a, a plant and say, okay, here are, you know, um, this type of, um, of flower and a new species will develop as it's introduced to a new environment. Or maybe you have, you know, for example, people will talk about like fruit flies in Hawaii. There's like 500 different species of fruit flies in Hawaii that have uh, evolved and developed or adapted to their environment filling different niches and um, microclimates within the, you know, e ecological system there in Hawaii. Um, and that's happening, you know, fruit flies are developing into different species of fruit flies based on their environment. That's microevolution. And Brandon Chadwick uh, make the very impo important argument, I think it's often um, missed how significant this is, that there's nothing in scripture and there's nothing in the creationist or interventionist worldview that is against, you know, microevolution or speciation, if I'm saying that right. Um, because we do see, you know, uh, not all the breeds of dogs that we have today existed 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. And the same can be true for all different kinds of birds and plants and things like that. So, yes, we do see evolution in that sense all around us. And that's a really important insight to understand the life that we see on our planet. So they're making the argument that a lot of the evidence that gets thrown up as support for evolution needs to be kind of sorted out. Is this actually an argument for macroevolution? You know, the idea that all life comes from one source um, and that it's developed randomly and that, you know, birds and reptiles and mammals and all this have kind of evolved one from the other? Or is this an argument that makes more sense within, a, within a, a view that says, you know, God has created, you know, mammals and reptiles and all of these different kingdoms and, and, um, and orders and all those types of things. Um, sorry, I'm probably getting the, the categories jumbled here. I told you, theologians and pastors, we can repeat arguments that people say and maybe we'll get some details wrong so my scientist friends can straighten me out uh, in the comments there. But, you know, that, that God has created those, those, those broad categories of creatures and that there's development within that. Absolutely, that's not a problem. Um, but oftentimes arguments that are advanced for uh, evolution are supporting microevolution and the evidence for macroevolution is much thinner and much more suspect. So they do a good job of kind of laying out where are we actually uh, agreeing, where are we disagreeing, and then they go through the main arguments for evolution and the arguments against it. They have a whole chapter where um, they just are arguing for macroevolution. And you can read that chapter and go, wow, this sounds so convincing. And then they have a chapter saying, okay, here are the challenges that someone who holds to that has to address. Here are the weak spots. Here are the responses we can make. And it gives a whole different picture. And um, and so it does a good job of, 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 of dealing with that. So they have several hundred pages 
dealing with the question of the origin of life and issues of evolution. And then they have about 300 pages. It's a very significant part. Uh, the authors have training in geology and paleontology, so that's a big issue for them. So they spend the last half of the book, really, going through the geological record and dealing with the questions of, you know, the fossil column, the age of the earth, that kind of thing. Again, from a scientific perspective, very thorough, very interesting. Um, that gets pretty in-depth, but it's it's overall a very good, um, very good, uh, you know, pairing of things, dealing with kind of the issue of science as a discipline and its relation to faith and reason and so forth, and then dealing with the question of origins and evolution, and then dealing with the questions of geology and the age of the earth. That's kind of the three parts of the book. Now, there's a lot I could say about those things. I'm not going to try to repeat the arguments that they make or I'll just bungle the details, but let me give it kind of in closing here what I think is the contribution of this volume, maybe relative to other volumes that you might find out there uh, as well. I've already mentioned a couple. One is it's focusing itself on the scientific discussion, and I think that's a really great uh, um, way of coming at this. Um, it, it, it's also, um, again, making some really good distinctions and talking about the foundational issues, not just the arguments we want to talk about you know, at the front end, um, but then the second, the, or the third thing would be that as it engages with those scientific um, debates, it really does a good job. The authors are very conscious, and you can tell this is a conscious choice they're making, to avoid some of the kind of rhetorical fireworks that often um, we find in these debates and discussions. So a lot of books that you'll find on this, but if it's coming from the creationist side, it might be something like, you know, Darwin defeated or something like that would be the title of the book. And it's just trying to sort of say, you know, anyone who believes in macroevolution is just an idiot and they don't have eyes to see and it's not complicated at all, right? Sometimes you'll get that kind of uh, vibe and you definitely get it from the other side. Just again, go into a polite society and tell them you're a creationist and you will get lots of heat uh, scorn heaped upon you um, and attacks and things like that and they'll dismiss your intelligence and say you can't be a thinking person how could you ever challenge that and oftentimes the debate plays out in that tone and, and on that plane and Brandon and Chadwick are trying to say no we can make a really strong argument against Darwinian evolution against macroevolution against an old earth and and they do that again this is a 600 page book where they're, they're working through those things but they also say it's important to recognize the complexity of issues there and to deal with things very fairly. So one of the things that I really appreciate is they have these sidebars throughout the book where they'll they'll say they'll be talking about an issue, you know, and then they'll say, okay, so what's the data that we have? Here's and they'll just kind of list, here's the data. Now, what's the interpretation of that data? What's the way that a, a Darwinian evolutionist or their term that they use is methodological naturalist? That's the kind of methodological naturalism versus informed interventionism. Those are their terminology, but that's that's how they kind of will say, okay, here's the data. Now, here's how a methodological naturalist would approach that and interpret that, and here's how an informed interventionist would interpret that data. And they'll point out, sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's different, but there's always interpretation at play, and so they're very open and honest about that, and I think that's a real strength. Um, and that gets to one of the things that I think is wonderful about this book. It's something that I could hand to someone who's not already convinced of my position, and I think they would give it a, a fair hearing because the authors are trying to speak fairly and openly and honestly and to kind of give their uh, conversation partners the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean that they downplay the significance of these issues. In fact, they underscore them at different points in time, but they're not coming in in a kind of dismissive or adversarial way, and I think that lends strength to their argument. In fact, one of the things that they'll do is to not only interact with the arguments of people uh, on the other side, but interact with arguments of people on their side, creationist arguments, and point out which ones are good arguments and which ones are not so good arguments. And again, um, the position, I would say, is something that we can get from Scripture. But how you get to that position scientifically, you know, how do you explain the, the mechanics of Noah's flood or the mechanics of, of the development of different life forms or things like that. Those are things where there can be competing theories and models scientifically that are that are argued for. Um, but uh, we've got to have the best arguments that we can and be willing to evaluate those as we learn more about the world. The theological and exegetical questions, 
we can have ground, you know, much more grounded uh, arguments for, and those shouldn't really be changing because we're dealing with something that doesn't change versus the scientific, you know, endeavor is a different, it's a different discipline, has a different methodology, has different goals and aims, different opportunities, different limitations. And so they do a good job of, of recognizing that. And that makes this book something that, again, I feel like I could hand to a, a thoughtful, scientifically minded Christian who's been wrestling with this issue and it would walk them through it in a really helpful way. Or I can hand it to someone who's not a Christian at all and just say, hey, look, before you dismiss this view as being ridiculous, would you read this book, give it a fair hearing, and at least recognize that you can be a thinking person and a, 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 a fair and accurate scientist even withholding to this view. And that's kind of where they end up with the book. They have a good chapter or two at the end where they kind of pull some of those threads together and they just make the argument, look, oftentimes Christians are afraid to go into the sciences or scientists are afraid of Christians because they kind of see them as being mutually exclusive. And they say, really? And it's over this issue of evolution, a Darwinian evolution. And they say, look, really, um, there's whole disciplines within science that are completely unaffected by whether you hold a Darwinian evolution or not. In other words, holding to that view doesn't get you anywhere in terms of the actual science. It may be something that a lot of people believe, right? It may be something that gets referenced, but is it actually driving research? Is it actually something that doctors are using day to day in developing treatments or people who are studying botany are using day to day when they're researching plants or developing, you know, uh, medicines or, you know, products from them? You know, not, not really. And so they do a good job of saying sometimes we've We've, um, you know, we've acted like you have to hold to this neo-Darwinian view before you can engage in science, and that's not the case. And they, and they, they give examples of, of good, faithful scientists who are doing good, peer-reviewed work who don't hold to the Darwinian view. And uh, that's a really important argument, I think, again, for the scientific establishment to reckon with and for Christians to recognize, too. And so if I had a young person who was interested in the sciences, I would make this required reading. Definitely, definitely. And I would make this re required reading for any kind of, maybe a thoughtful high schooler, definitely college age. It's kind of a college textbook. That would be kind of the the, the, the level at which it's pitched. Um, but if you have someone who's kind of going into those college ages and is either grappling with this issue in particular or wants to go into the sciences, um, or if you have a friend who is not a Christian and just cannot understand how someone could question Darwin on this, this would be... Uh, the book I would hand them if they're a serious student. And that would be my caveat. There are other books that may do a better job of, you know, in 200 pages, kind of at a popular level, um, giving people things to think about. This is a more substantial work, but I think it's worth it. And I think the discipline of reading through this has helped me to better understand science, to better think through the questions of, you know, the origin of life, to better be able to delineate where uh, a creationist and an evolutionist would uh, agree and disagree, and then to think through um, what a, a Christian's role in the sciences might look like. So there's a lot there to think about, but um, it was a really good book. I very much enjoyed it. And one last thing I'll say, someone recommended this book to me uh, as uh, the best book they had read on this subject, and the person who recommended it is an online friend who's a cultural commentator and has a, a real interest in science. And so that's what prompted me to, to look it up. And when I first looked it up, I saw that because it's a textbook, it's it can be a little pricey, but it was free on Kindle. And I just rechecked again today, and it looks like it's always free on Kindle. So if you go to Amazon and you look up Faith, Reason, and Earth History by Leonard Brand and Arthur Chadwick, you should be able to find this book. You should be able to get a hold of it. And I would highly recommend, if you have any interest in these issues at all, getting a copy and spending some time reading it, because I think it will be a help and a blessing to you. So those are my thoughts on Faith, Reason, and Earth History by Leonard Brand and Arthur Chadwick.